Why would you pay for an engineer to design a yacht when the engineering costs more than the yacht? Hello, everybody. I am Nick, the naval architect. As a consultant engineer, I often have to consider things like this when I'm looking at the value of my services. I search for opportunities where the benefit of engineering matches the cost. And small boats have always defied logic for me. For small ships and yachts, the cost of the engineering often exceeds the value of the ship. I pondered this for several years. I was thinking, what does engineering add that is so critical to this ship? Then I realized that the value of engineering was not in the yacht it produced. The value lies in the lives, the people that the yacht protects. The primary purpose for an engineer is not to produce a pretty yacht. That's a secondary goal, but still valuable. Our main purpose is to produce a safe ship a product that protects human life. But like I said, I am a consultant, so I always have to think about the business implications also. I have to ask, how much is that protection actually worth? The answer to that question comes from risk analysis, and this is what I want to talk about today. Risk analysis is a general field of study that's focused on predicting the value of safety. Risk analysis allows us to look at these scary things in the world and quantify them, decide on an appropriate level of safety based upon that quantification. We create a rational structure for rational decisions in an uncertain world. So today I'm going to demonstrate the power of risk analysis by looking at the value of engineering when applied to yachts. Now don't worry, this won't be a math lesson. It's true that the mathematics behind risk analysis can get pretty intensive when we consider complicated systems like a nuclear reactor. But the core concept behind all of that math is pretty simple. What we call risk is the probability of something bad happening multiplied by the consequences of that event. You just have to answer two questions. What are the odds of something happening? And what is the outcome of that event? Multiply those two, and you know the risk. Normally, we're going to measure the cost of a bad thing as some sort of dollar value, as a useful unit of measure. Insurance companies love risk analysis, especially when we talk about dollar values. It gives them a basis to set their premiums for insurance, because they can quantify the average payout that they're going to produce for all of the accidents in a year. And a lot of that payout has little to do with materials and mostly focuses on the cost of human lives, which means that they absolutely do place a value on human life. The first step we're going to have in risk analysis is we're going to find out the, the cost of human life is a big factor. So how much is a human worth? $10 million. Yep. That is the approximate value for a single human life. Now, at first, I thought this was too high, but I found two sources that roughly agreed with this number. The first source came from a statistical comparison of hazard pay people were willing to accept to work higher risk jobs. I still couldn't believe it at first, so I also checked on lawsuits. Wrongful death lawsuits are a real fear for a manufacturer. Now, the results of a wrongful death lawsuit vary wildly, but one law firm did post some results from some of their cases. The payouts were in the range of about $10 million. So yes, one human life is worth 10 million US dollars on average. Now, this is just a simple approximation today. I'm sure that an insurance firm has far more detailed assessments of human life. And that shows one of the hardest parts of risk analysis. Accurate data is scarce, but for our arguments today, let's assume that a single human costs $10 million. Kind of surprised me, but also reassuring. Life can be expensive. Right. Now that we know the cost of disaster, what are the odds? This can be the hardest question in risk analysis. We frequently pay hundreds of dollars for accurate data sets 
trying to determine the probability of something. Personally, I was not willing to pay hundreds of dollars for a free article that I was producing, so I limited my research to free data sets. One great resource was the U.S. Coast Guard's annual boating safety report. This is a gold mine of data, chock full of useful information. Most important, it gave me data on the total number of deaths and injuries grouped by boat type. But what do we compare these accidents against to get a probability? We're not interested in the total number. We want to know total number of accidents per something. Well, common options would be number of boats, uh, total people on the water, or maybe total time spent on the water. And this is where we have to consider the audience. I'm presenting this from the perspective of a boat manufacturer. The manufacturer only controls the boat. Once we sell that boat, we don't have any control over where the boat gets used, how often, who uses it, where it gets sold. So I'm normalizing all of the accidents by the number of boats. Great. Now, by comparing the number of boating accidents against the total number of boats, we have the probability of an accident for each boat category. But that doesn't tell the whole story. This probability includes all of the boats currently on the market. If a boating accident occurs, we need the chances that that accident applies to one of the new boats that we just produced as our potential manufacturer. So we're concerned with the probability that an accident happened and that it was one of our boats. This is called the conditional probability, the combined chances of two bad things happening together. And this is one of the neat parts about risk analysis, is you can start to stack up this sort of thing. Because we quite often find that in accidents, there's what we call a chain of disaster. Many things have to happen before the ultimate bad thing happens. And so we can look at that chain as a series of conditional probabilities. What is the probability of A, and B, and C, and D all happening? Now, in the case of our yachts, the probability of an accident happening and it being related to one of the new boats produced that year gives a very low conditional probability, with odds that are in the range of 1 in 40,000. That's pretty good. Not as safe as a nuclear reactor, but still fairly safe. Thanks to the U.S. Coast Guard data, we know the average number of deaths and injuries per boating accident. We know the cost of a death as $10 million. Multiply all those costs and rates together with the probability of failure. That's our conditional probability. And we have the average risk. Now here is where we can start to get some really interesting information out of risk analysis. Take a look at the table on your screen. Start comparing the odds of failure with the risk involved and then also compare it to the chart that I showed you previously on the, the last slide. So for example, looking at the small categories of boats under 16 feet and boats under 26 feet, we see that there's a huge number of boats in this category. And you compare that to deaths per boat in say, the 65 foot category. By just comparing those, you might think, oh gee, these small boats are really unsafe. There's a much higher ratio of deaths and accidents there but that data can be misleading. Let's look at it instead on the probability and the risk analysis basis. Now looking at that in the table, we see that our small boats under 16 feet and the 16 to 26 foot category, those are actually really safe boats. Or we have very good odds of failure there, one in 40,000 thereabouts. That's why they have a very low risk associated with them, only about 160 or 130 US dollars. But now let's compare that over to the larger boats, say the 40 to 65 foot category. The odds of failure for that boat are only one in 4,000. That's actually pretty high. That's why when you run all the math through, that 40 to 65 range is actually the highest risk. And that's the power of risk analysis, is we're not only seeing how much we should actually be concerned about things, now that we're breaking this down per boat length, you can start to see, okay, where is it better to spend money on engineering? Where is it better to focus more on safety? Where is it going to hurt more if I have a problem? But I'm not done with math yet. Now, when I first saw these risks, they seemed a little bit low to me. 
instinctively you think, hold on, these are big, expensive boats carrying lots of people. Shouldn't that number be a little higher? And then I remembered where I got my data from. This was all based on the accidents from only a single year. Well, manufacturers don't sell a boat and then take it back after a year. When you build and sell a boat, you accept the risk and potential in lawsuits during the entire lifetime of that boat. That risk that we saw in the last table, that occurs every single year that the boat exists. So we need to extrapolate that to the total risk accumulated over the entire lifespan of a boat. So I went behind the scenes and did some fancy math to extrapolate from one year to an assumed 50-year lifespan on the boat, assuming that every year is an independent event. Now we get our updated table showing the total risk per boat that you produce. Suddenly the numbers start to add up. We're starting to see some potentially high risk, especially for that 40 to 65 foot category. Now that's starting to be something you might worry about. And the story gets even worse if you do mass production of boats, lots of hulls per year, which most shipyards want to be a mass producer. They want to do at least more than one hull per year. Remember that that financial risk was for every boat that you produce. It's a risk that keeps growing as you produce more boats. Now let's really ramp it up. Imagine you're a big manufacturer producing over 140 foot boats in a year. That means that you have a risk of $1.6 million every year. In that range, you would be a fool to not be hiring engineering to double check all of your work. Even the lowest category of boats under 16 feet, even if you only produce 10 per year, the risk accumulates at $81,000 per year. Here's where my little plug for engineering comes in. Compare that risk against the cost of engineering. If the engineer charged you $40,000 to create a safe design for those 10 boats, you would still come out ahead because it reduces the risk. Sure, in your daily balance sheets, you're thinking, gee, I'm just paying out money for this engineer. What's it getting me? Your story would completely change the day that you got news that there was an accident involving one of your boats. Suddenly, you're going to feel very grateful that you have that engineering to protect you. Now, before I sound too convincing, I do have to mention that I took several shortcuts in my analysis. I promise you, somewhere there is a mathematician currently yelling at their computer in frustration over all the little slip-ups that I've made. My style of presentation makes for snappy dialogue and compelling arguments, but it hides the understanding behind the numbers. So in fairness to the honesty of numbers, the next video that I produce is going to review all of my analysis here from a critical standpoint and attack my own analysis to point out the holes of my statistical approach. For now, just accept that my findings have room for debate. But the central point does still stand. The cost of engineering is definitely high, but the cost of failure is even higher. And that's the value that I see in engineering. We are there primarily to guard against disaster. This shows up in many practical benefits. The engineers create all of the documentation to prove your safety, and that's going to be your best defense against any lawsuit. In many cases, the engineer is actually accepting responsibility for the design of the boat, shifting much of that legal liability away from you. Although I suspect there are loopholes in this, I'm not an attorney, so I would definitely consult with one if you're concerned about this. But beyond the business end, there's another reason in favor of engineering. It simply makes the ship safer. Every manufacturer that I talk to always wants to build good quality, safe boats. I've never had a manufacturer say that they want a bad boat. But there is a question of how much is safety worth? How much do you need safety? Engineering helps to refine this idea. When you ask what is needed for safety, engineers find the answer. And today I've shown how risk analysis can be one of the tools for refining that question. So how much is safety worth to you? Well, this risk analysis gives a good indication. I also want to emphasize the other important lesson behind this risk analysis. 
It shows that safety, it's not just a comforting idea. Safety is a performance standard. We can define it. We can measure it, monitor it, give it a dollar value. Safety adds real, quantifiable value to your ships and your business. Engineers create safety, and that ultimately helps your bottom line. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Sorry, everybody. No kitschy catchphrase today. Just some simple straight talk. Engineering is not about the ship. It's about what do you want to do with that ship. The future is focused on performance-based design. How are we going to use engineering solutions to turn this ship into an asset for your business goals? That is what DMS achieves. Engineered solutions for improved business performance in the marine field. If that sounds interesting to you, give us a call and let's see what we can do.